It's always a great thing to be ready to come before you with, in the presence of the Lord today. I'm just, uh, I can't tell you a morning that I haven't gotten up and just been excited about the Word of God and excited about the op opportunity to share it with you in the name of Jesus. Good morning, Ecclesia. Good morning, those of you who know who you are. And I believe more and more you're understanding who you are, that you are those who God has called out to, to, to bind and to loose in the earth today. You are those who are being called out to make a difference in this earth in the name of Jesus. You are his ruling counsel. Praise the name of the Lord. I greet you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's never a time that your word does not go out and it returns unto you for it, but it accomplishes what you sent it to do. Father, I pray that those who are hearing today, Father, will become that place where your word will be accomplished in the name of Jesus. Position them, Father, so that your word will permeate their spirit and they, it will return unto you, Father, in the name of Jesus, productive and prospering in the thing that you sent it to do. Father, I trust you to do that. I bless you for that today. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. Well, praise God, saints. I'm just so excited about being here this morning. Amen. Uh, we're going to get right into it. I'd like to remind you many times of my assignment, what God has called me to do. Number one, I am to teach the clarity of what ecclesia is all about. Number two, I'm going to show you how to begin to walk in ecclesia. And then thirdly, I am to uh, establish, develop, and release networks of gatherings, house gatherings specifically, that reflect the values and structure demonstrated by first century believers. So that is the backdrop so you know always with the foundation from what, from what I teach. Amen. Praise God. Let's get into our word because I believe there's some things we really need to unpack today and I want to get right at, right at it. Matthew 16 verses 18 through 20. We do this every single day. So by now you should almost have it memorized. It says, upon this rock, I say unto you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia, boy, I'm not pronouncing it right, am I? That's one thing about life broadcast, you do things and realize, hey, I can't go back and change that. Well, here it is. I say unto you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. Praise God. How is Jesus building his ecclesia? That's the series we're in right now. We're dealing with ecclesia, but now we're opening up to find out how he is building his ecclesia. We're in the sixth part of that teaching. Now, I'd like to open up today because we're going to get back to Isaiah 61, and this will make more sense to you. Uh, I want to get back to uh, remind you of a, of a story. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you uh, about the work of ministry and a misconception of the work of ministry that I had happened several years ago. I was teaching a class on the fivefold ministers, and as I was teaching it, I posed the question. Uh, I said, you know, they were given to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And then I posed the question to the, to the class, what is the work of ministry? And one sister raised her hand and she began to describe, well, it's understanding how to be a good, you know, how ushers work and how, how the ushers work. Understanding, like, if you want in leadership, like how to become a, uh, uh, a head of a, a department, how to work in the food service, in the nursery, in the sound room. And she began to outline all of these things uh, as the work of ministry. And so after allowing her to go on for some time, I just finally asked one basic question. I said, you and to all the class, do you realize that when Paul wrote that, that none of those things that you mentioned even existed? And there was this hush that came over the room because everybody realized, wait a minute, there were no ushers, there were no sound teams, there was no parking lot teams. That, you know, that was not the work of ministry he was talking about. I'm not going to go into all of those different things and the, and the issue that it created, but I do want you to understand a principle here. And that is too often we look at the word of God and we read our experiences into it. And therefore we assume that our experiences is what the writer must have intended when he wrote it almost 2000 years ago. And those misconceptions have caused a, a, a system of doing church that I believe is uh, God is beginning to correct and beginning to 
change and begin to deal with because uh, a lot of those things that we see in scripture did not exist. My God, if we can understand the Western mindset, how it has been superimposed into scripture, it would really blow us away. So I want to uh, start off, and this is going to make more sense as I get into Isaiah 61 in a few moments. Uh, so we've asked the question, how is Jesus building his ecclesia? Well, we have a, a very global answer to that, and that is he's doing it through men and women who have a revelation that he is the Christ, son of the living God, and who are led by the Holy Spirit and embrace the values of the kingdom of heaven in a structure that is conducive both to spiritual and numerical growth. Again, we say that over and over because I want you to get that as a working definition of how he is building his ecclesia. The ecclesia was given authority to establish policies, legislate, confer, deny citizenship, and elect officials. Uh, the ecclesia can bind anything that heaven is already bound in, and it can loose anything that heaven is already loosed And The ecclesia is the sole representative of the kingdom of heaven in the earth. So now we get to Isaiah 61. I want to go back to there, Isaiah 61, because again, it will give us a prophetic glimpse of God's intent for you and for me. Scripture is filled with many types and shadows that reveal uh, God's intent for his ecclesia. And uh, I believe Isaiah 61 will, will encourage you and strengthen you. Uh, as we go into that, I want you to keep this in mind, that the church as we know it is in transition. The church system was never designed to release the saints at the level that was intended by God in the first place. Uh, in fact, if, there's, if you did a careful review of like the book of Acts, uh, it will reveal a flowing, organic body of believers who impacted life where it happened. It was organic, but get this, it was uniquely organized. So don't think just because it was organic, it was just anybody just kind of do anything, hallelujah, we just know it was well organized. There were so, and there are right now social, economic, and technological, and political factors that are putting pressure on the church system as we know it. Uh, and there are those of us who are beginning to prophetically declare that uh, the, the current church system uh, is, is now under attack. I guess that's the best way I might want to put it. Uh, but we, I need you to understand that there's a, such a shift taking place. And right now, even though it's a shift taking place, the current church system feels like it is still intact and it looks like it's still flourishing. But that doesn't mean that we cannot begin to declare what we see in the spirit. Out of this shifting, out of this transition that is taking place is coming what I call the Day of the Saints. And I, others have used this term. Uh, Dr. Bill Hammond has a book called The Day of the Saints. And I believe uh, we're talking about the Day of the Saints. And I will honestly tell you, I enjoyed his book, Day of the Saints, even though it was written in the context of church. Okay, the day of the saints is when believers are released to freely pursue their calling, purpose, and ministry to expand the kingdom of God in the earth. And so uh, when they're freely released, and I have to use that term freely released because you need to understand how that begins to work. The day of the saints deals directly with the issue of releasing the saints from the hierarchical system that has prohibited uh, uh, its ability to expand, expand the kingdom of God. Hierarchy was never a uh, system of the kingdom. It was definitely a church system. Uh, leadership was designed to enhance and strengthen the work of the saints, not controlled and limited. The day of the saints is a result of the fivefold ministers being in place to equip the saints. Uh, in the season of transition, whether it's seen or unseen, uh, it will empower the believers when they begin to grasp what God is beginning to do. Ephesians 3 and 5, it says uh, he's given revelations to apostles and prophets for things that have been hidden over many generations. And those things are now coming to light. Uh, we've functioned, obviously, in this church system so long that uh, the Lord's intent for his ecclesia is often foreign. I'm, I'm getting to Isaiah 61, so hold on. But I'd like you to have this uh, as we go into it. I'm addressing the system of church and not the people. I want to say that again. I am addressing the system and not the people. I'm dealing with incorrect thought patterns. Uh, I will not attack the people. It's kind of uh, productive to attack someone for doing something that they have no idea is even wrong. 
Uh, I cannot attack people, okay, uh, who are actively involved in the only system that they have ever known. But I can bring to light that that system has some errors that do not, uh, errors, and that they have problems that you find that conflict with what we see in the Word of God. Uh, many wonderful things have happened in the church system. People have been saved, people have been healed, people have been delivered, lives have been changed, and it is the rightness of these things that makes seeing the error of the system very difficult for many people. So therefore, for you find many times prophetically people are, are proclaiming things in a season when it's very difficult for people to see it because what they're doing feels and seems right. So I pray like Elisha did for his servant. You remember when they were surrounded by the, uh, the armies? The servant went out and saw them surrounded. He said, oh, master, what would we do? And I like what Elisha did. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. That's all he prayed. Lord, just open his eyes that he may see. I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that each person listening to this right now, that you open their eyes that they may see. God, I'll release what you call me to release, but God, you open their eyes that they may see in the name of Jesus. Why do I pray this? Because prophetic clarity comes through accurate sight. And so when you get accurate sight, then you begin to get prophetic clarity. Oh, let's get to Isaiah 61. Um, this word was given to me in December of 1993. That's when the Lord really impacted me with that word. And in that, he told me that this is my strategy. That was, goes back to 1993. It is taking me 25 years now to really begin to understand this, to understand this in uh, some level that really begins to make sense. Now, I begin to get it over the years and more and more it begins to make more sense. But it's really beginning to open up to me right now uh and 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 when he spoke this to me back in 1993 he made it very clear that this is his strategy this is the way that he is building uh his his work his his ecclesia if you will in the earth uh now in Isaiah 61 now you remember in Luke 4 Jesus used that same passage uh and it's uh it was Jesus clarification of this particular chapter, Isaiah 61, that angered the religious mindsets of that day. Uh, when they heard the way he approached this, it got them ups upset. He declared, now remember he declared that the fulfillment of that passage had come. He said, this day is this word fulfilled in your hearings. Uh, and then he also declared uh, that no prophet is accepted as his own country. Now, why would he throw that in there? Uh, that is because prophetically, uh, people want you to prophesy, but only in context with the, their per personal and current beliefs and the religious status quo. In other words, they don't want you to prophesy something that, you know, will conflict with where they are. They want you to con uh, prophesy in context of the religious status quo. Uh, and then they use familiarity, you know, uh, ain't that Joseph's boy? That's Joe's boy, ain't it? Hey man, ain't that Joe's boy down there yet? Oh, he sounds so good. You know, they were dealing with him and they marveled at his gracious words uh, until divine intent was exposed. And when it was exposed, it conflicted with the current religious beliefs and protocol. And so the review of Isaiah 61 reveals divine intent, not just for Jesus' time, but for all ages. Looking at now, Isaiah 61 and one. Here we go. Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. Okay, I want to start this by saying there is a word that when it's received will change everything about a person's life. I understand that uh, this Isaiah 61 is considered one of the messianic uh, verses uh, foretelling a lot about Jesus Christ. And yet, at the same time, I want to remind you that the Lord is raising up apostolic and prophetic voices to preach good tidings to the poor, or as Jesus said, uh, to the meek. Uh, in Isaiah uh, 61, he said meek, and, and in, in Luke, he said to the poor. Now, what is the poor? And the poor is anyone who de de deprived of the basic necessities uh, 
to survive in all dimensions. See, the first thing we go to is economic poverty. That's what we go to. But I want to help you understand, uh, economic is one part of it. Uh, that's lacking the resources uh, to acquire the basic needs like food, clothing, and shelter. But there's also social poverty. Uh, there's people who are de deprived and disenfranchised because of things like race, the God-given gender. I'm going to make that clear. The God-given gender and not the chosen gender. <clears throat> That'll hit you about 2 o'clock this afternoon. And they're, they're deprived because of status and things like that. So is social poverty. The third thing is intellectual poverty. There's missing, they're missing the mental skills or the understanding necessary to navigate through life. That's either by lack of education or their inability to comprehend it or even uh, by willful miscon uh, misconceptions, you know, so uh, that have been taught. Like I started off about the work of ministry. You remember that? You know, that those things have been uh, built into the mindsets of people so they miss a lot of things that are going on. The message to the poor is the good news that you are not left out. That's what the message to the poor is. God can take you from where you are and take you to where you should be. Praise God. So the first thing he says, preach good news to the poor. And the second is to bind up the brokenhearted. That's an act of restoration. It's interceding for those who have been wounded in life. Praise God. It's binding up. And in this case... It is the act of covering a wound and allowing it to heal. It's protecting the wound from further damage and simultaneously uh, preparing them to be restored and to be productive in life. Third thing he says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's not the same as binding up the broken hearted. You know, uh, it is to proclaim liberty to the captives of those who are held by sin. Uh, most people are, who are estranged from God want a way out of their current state. I've had people, uh, I remember years ago, was a young man came to my office, he was a drug dealer, he was a big drug dealer, and he came in my office and cried like a baby, and said, I want out, I want out of this, he said, but I'm stuck, I don't know how to get out of this, and, I, and I, it was amazing that, you know, that I heard a man who on the outside, you know, people thought he was the man, you know, but he was crying out, I want to get out, you see, sin has a way of capturing people uh, and from so many angles that uh, often freedom will cause such a level of loss. Uh, so, you know, people are quick to judge. You know, religious folks get quick to judge. Yeah, they just in sin. They, just, they need to come out. They just need to come out. But don't you be so quick to judge because uh, there's so many situations that sin will do to capture people. It will make them captives. I'm going to give you an example. I do not agree with uh, those who live outside of marriage uh, when, when they come together and <clears throat> without getting married and, and, they, and they live together. But then I've seen many a situation, I've seen a situation where a man and a woman, uh, a young couple gets together and they've been living together. They have children together. They're raising a family together. They're not married. You understand what I'm saying? They're not married. And then I saw the young woman who gave her heart to the Lord. I mean, just it was miraculously saved. But here's what happened next. Uh, you know, she was in a situation and the, and the church said, well, you're living in sin. You got to move out of that house. You can't be living with that man. You can't be living with that man. Now, again, I want to say this clearly. I don't agree with living outside of marriage. I keep saying that because people got misconstrued things. I want to, I want to keep confronting your religious thinking here. And, but they kept saying, you got to move out. You got to move out. You got to move out. Now, here was a woman who wasn't working. And here was a woman who had, I think it was that time she had three children by this man who was taking care of him. He had no desire to get saved. He, at that point, he had no desire to get saved. Are you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and he didn't want anything to do with, quote, what we call the church as we know it. And now the church folks were telling her she had to move out because she was saved. But not one of those church people was stepping up to the plate and saying, okay, now we're going to take care of your children. We're going to take care of you. We're going to make sure you have shelter. We're going to make sure you have all those type things. You, and by the way, you can make, just move in with me until uh, things turn around for you. None of them offered that. All they did is say, you got to move out. You got to move out. And they were willing to allow her to move out, possibly get on the state and actually put her in a worse situation than she was at that point because uh, he was really doing a good job of taking care of them even though they were doing it in a system that wasn't right. And see, what, this is how sin takes people captive and then we want to be so quick. This is why Ecclesia, you need to understand how you need to get involved in the lives of people. You can't just look at them and say, you know, you got to come out of sin. Sometimes you got to be there to bind up 
wounds. Sometimes you got to be there to, to, to lay hands on and you got to be involved in their situations. Amen. And then the final, next part is to proclaim liberty to the captives, but then the opening of prison to them that are bound. That's not the same as captives. These are people who are held in incorrect systems. Uh, uh, and, and the difference is understand the difference between the church and ecclesia. The church uh, is one system. Ecclesia is another system. And you see people who are bound and who are captured by these systems and they're so caught up in these systems and they believe that's all they know. That's all they know about uh, 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 religion and so forth is what they get through a system that in this case is absolutely correct. Incorrect rather. So we need to understand people who are bound uh, and so we need to start dealing with that. Now the next part is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Praise God. And the day of vengeance of our God and the comfort all that mourn. My, <laughs> time goes too fast. Amen. Uh, when we start talking about proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, you need to understand that spiritual seasons must be proclaimed. Expectations of what happens in that season must be defined. And many times they're defined by prophetic voices who begin to explain what takes place in the season, the urgency of the season, the impact must be proclaimed. Remember, Jesus said, This day, this word is fulfilled. Praise God. We're going to have to pick up and finish this tomorrow, and I plan to do that. Amen. Uh, Holy Spirit is going to help us to do this so we can get through this uh, and move on to uh, newer things. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you, God, that they're hearing your word. Father, they're seeing how you're forming your ecclesia. They're seeing how you're doing this, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father. I thank you, God, that you're, the entrance of your word giveth light, giveth revelation in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Thank you all for watching. Amen. We're here Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. Thank you so much for tagging your friends. Thank you so much for sharing it on your timeline. I just bless you. I bless you. Thank you for watching all over from wherever you're watching from right now. I just bless you for it. And I thank you for each of you uh, uh, being a part of this. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to uh, ask you to pray for us as we're entering into this weekend where we're having our Ecclesia encounter. I'm excited about it. Amen. I just believe God is setting up some things beyond what we can ask or think in the name of Jesus. So pray for us. Amen. Check out our Facebook page and like it, please. And tell your friends to go like it in the name of Jesus. And check out our website in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. Amen. And we like to close with the same thing before our time runs out. I'm looking at my timer and it says this, that God is still on the throne. The devil is defeated and Jesus is Lord, you be blessed.